Hello, everyone. Welcome to the grand opening of the EBD seminar season. <laughs> um, to this grand opening, we will have Victor, who's just arrived into the EBD. He's actually visiting right now, but he will start a uh, Ramonica Hall here with us in January. Um, Victor uh, is Ukrainian, but he's been working in Germany for the past many years. Late, uh, his last stop was in Munich, and he's an aquatic biologist, right? Really interested in ecology of insects, so... Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, um, oh, sorry, I need this. I'm delighted to... Yeah. Okay. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm delighted to present sort of some of eight years of my research, um, which would be highly interdisciplinary, but basically uh, in my research I deal with insect decline, its causes and effects for the wider ecosystems, and what we can do to better understand insect decline and hopefully mitigate its impact on the ecosystems and biosphere in the future. Um, just to give a very short intro, I um, work on extant and fossil insect systems. Uh, I study a lot of fossils from Eocene and Miocene to understand how insect communities have changed through time. I work in a lot with umbers, in particular Baltic umber, and also hope now to work with Spanish umber from Alave, with my colleagues from Barcelona. Um, and I also work a lot on extant insects uh, as a system, and my favorite system are non-biting midges, chironomids, which are the most widespread and abundant non-parasitic insects in the world. They are the only free-living insects you can find in Antarctica. They go in up to five, six thousand meters up into Himalayas, and they go in almost up to the North Pole, or at least to the Northern Pol Polar Circle in Greenland and Spitsbergen. So really cool animals, and you can answer a lot of grand questions with them. In fact, the very first practical application of phylogenetic systematics and biogeography was done by, uh, on chironomids in 1960s by Lars Brunden. So neat little animals, but uh, let's start with a seminar. So over the last 20 years, concern has been growing among the ecologists, conservationists, entomologists, general public and policy makers over so-called insect apocalypse, which is, I think, a very dramatic name. And um, in its scariness, it's probably hiding the magnitude of the problem. Um, the problem really jumped into the public eye with research of Holman et al., uh, which is a group of mostly amateur entomologists from a small German city of Krefeld, who were installing the Malay traps for over 40 years and measuring the biomass of flying insects collected to the traps. Just a biomass, just imagine this. They're simply weighing the collection jars they collected over 40 years, and that's what they've got. So the gray lines uh, are individual traps over years, and this is like a smoothed uh, median. And they recorded over 75% decline in the biomass of flying insects in the 40 years of observation in Krefeld, uh, which made quite a splash in the media in 2017 when paper came out. And that's when the term insect apocalypse was coined. However, the worries about declining abundance and diversity of terrestrial and aquatic invertebrates existed before like in a well-known paper of Dirzo et al. called Anthropocenic Defaunation. Um, disparate data on butterflies' abundance and even more disparate data on all the other insects and invertebrates showed a strong decline, but also with a lot of regional variation. Um, the punchline to that is um, our scope of view of abundance and diversity decline in insects is limited by the boundaries of our monitoring efforts. And most of the monitoring efforts have been conducted only since after the World War II. In some exceptional cases, you have a monitoring 
uh, data sets going back into the 19th century and even in 18th century, uh, like 18th century, like in case with some monitoring data sets of British butterflies. However, such long running data sets are extremely rare and it brings us to a problem of a shifting baseline. So we're starting with a starting point of our monitoring, assuming that community conditions were probably good and has improved or decreased since then. And we're comparing to this baseline. However, this baseline is not a true baseline because if you start recording your insects in 1950s, this is already 150 years into the Industrial Revolution. Climate change is fully kicked in, even though people was not that aware about it. Uh, and so in my work, I'm trying to address this problem of missing baseline, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But first, I'm going to talk about why insect decline, if it's indeed occurring, is such a big problem. Um, there are multiple ways in which decline in insect populations and impact of climate change on insect populations are changing our ecosystems. Uh, we've been attacking this problem from multiple angles. For example, one of my personally favorite research we have done is based on a 20 years old data, 20 years long data set of a crane fly, Tipula oleracea, which is a rather big, long-legged uh, fly from Germany. Uh, it was collected as adults and measured both by the wing length and body length and body mass for over 20 years at the river research station in Schlitz in middle Germany. This is an animal, this is a lovely Breitenbach stream when it was collected and that's where it's uh, situated in the Weser river basin in the central Hesse, federal land of Germany. Um, we also had a very um, thorough temperature record for the area taken by the in situ meteor station. And so what we wanted to know is how um, the climate change in the area and the climate change there was significant. The mean annual temperature has dec increased by 1.8 degrees in just 40 years in the middle Hesse actually outpacing the general European levels of warming and even outpacing most of the RCP models. But it's a mountainous region, so it's especially vulnerable to uh, global warming. So we wanted to know how this drastic warming has impacted the populations, especially in terms of the morphoecology of the flies. So we used the body measurements to see if the increase in temperature impacts the size and um, dispersal abilities of the flies. We have found out that um, wind gland was increasing with mean annual temperature, uh, as well as a sex ratio um, shifting towards male-dominated male populations. We also have found out that abundance of the flies has decreased uh, within the temperature gradient as they were becoming a bit larger. The punchline to that was that body weight has also increased with the temperature and the wing loading has increased. That means that a square centimeter of the wing had to bear more mass at the higher temperatures than at the lower temperatures. Essentially, it means that flies became less capable of dispersal, and particular, and, uh, which is potentially means lower gene flow between the metapop within the metapopulations, uh, and you know, the lower genetic diversity. Unfortunately, the Schlitz station was closed in 2010 and all the material, most of the ethanol material was lost and unrecoverable to my, I think it's actually a tragedy. So we were not able to test, say, haplotypic diversity over time in this population. But our hypothesis was that increasing wing loading and increasing body weight of these flies within temperature gradient increase would lead to the high, um, to the lower um, gene flow and lower mobility of the animals. So yeah, you know, climate change makes some flies fat, 
and less capable of moving around, which is bad for the flies. But that's not the only thing that climate change do. Some flies are actually growing bigger in the colder climate. So there is a long-standing discussion if Alan Bergman rules are applicable to poikiloterm animals. And a lot of entomologists measured butterflies, beetles, whatever, in the temperature gradient or latitudinal gradient, and they were saying, OK, my beetles are definitely following Alan Bergman rule. My butterflies are definitely don't. But if you think about it, why would poikiloterm animals worry that much about the surface to volume ratio if they don't produce heat endothermically? There were explanations like, well, insects do produce heat endothermically with muscles. So something like a bee, when it flies, it produces a lot of heat and it's inertial homeotherm. It could be 20 degrees uh, warmer than the ambient environment. And so that was one of the explanations. Maybe in colder climate, insects need a higher body mass and higher surface to volume ratio to prevent the heat loss. I was interested in it because obviously, if insects have a strong size temperature relationship, climate change is gonna impact them through this avenue too. So I just decided to take the group I already know, Coronomids. I sit down with a bunch of my students and we measured over 4,000 specimens of Coronomids. That's where the measurements came from, based on the museum collections from all over the world. And then we looked at the size trends, both within monophyletic groups, say within the genera, and within the entire group as coronamids. And what we found is that uh, the higher mean annual temperature is, the lower is the mean wing land for midges in this area. And it was followed both through the entire uh, undivided data set and within almost, most, almost all genera except for three out of 48 genera examined. Um, you can see that we have a strong size increase uh, from, uh, lower, uh, from higher to lower temperature in the Northern Hemisphere uh, data set, which is here showed as a smoothed orange model, and both in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Unfortunately, in Southern Hemisphere, we have much less land going to the poles. It stops at 48 uh, latitudes, and so the data set is not so extensive. So coronamids seemingly adhere to something very similar to Alan Bergman rule, but why? The explanation we come up with, looking at the trade-based analysis of the species, it's over 2,000 species which went into our analysis, we think that they get getting bigger in the colder climate because oxygen solubility in the colder water is higher and it's only dropped. So maximum oxygen solubility is at plus four degrees fresh water. And after four degrees, it's just keep dropping, dropping to almost only two milligrams at 30 degrees warm fresh water. And so we think that the larvae, aquatic larvae of coronamids simply has higher oxygen availability in cold water, which allows them to grow more. And basically, if you look at the analysis um, showing that insects becoming bigger in colder climates, like mammals, it's almost always insects with aquatic or semi-aquatic larvae, which means that it's probably an oxygen-limited uh, process. And oxygen is availability is kind of confounding people into linking this size temperature patterns with Alan Bergman rule. Uh, so there is that. We also, I'm sorry for this figure, but it's impossible to fit on the screen in any meaningful way. It's a trait-restricted phylogeny of coronamids, a subset of species we analyzed, about 10%, but all the genera which were present. We found that size within coronamids was more strongly influenced by the temperature than the phylogenetic position. So even within genera, with the very large specimens by fly standards, on average, the tropical representatives were almost always smaller than the Arctic ones, unless they come from the mountains, because you then have an altitudinal gradient as well. Um, what climate change 
also does to insects, and it's also related to the temperature, it makes some insects to breathe faster and demand more oxygen, but also introduce a vast biogeochemical changes into the environment. So this is actually from my PhD. Uh, we were looking at how the temperature change in the Central European lakes impact the bioturbation processes, so biological mixing of solutes and sediments by larvae of coronamids, which are very important bioturbators, you know, this tiny red larvae, which you might have seen if you have aquarium or go in fishing. Uh, they, in fact, pump so much water through the lake bottom that a 10 kilometer square uh, surface area lake 10 meters deep, is getting pumped through the burrows of coronamid larvae once a day, essentially. This is not a hypothetical calculation. This is actually a lake on which I done my PhD in Germany. Um, for my thesis, uh, we really wanted to measure how much oxygen does larvae demand in the sediment and how much oxygen does bacterial biota of the sediment borrowed by larvae demands. Um, this is important because we know that bioturbators stimulate oxygen demand of sediment bacteria, therefore increasing CO2 emission from the, um, uh, from the sediments. So essentially bioturbators has a capacity to switch the aquatic sediments from CO2 uh, sink to CO2 source which is potentially very important for understanding greenhouse gas balance. Uh, and it's kind of difficult to partition respiration and oxygen demand of larvae and bacteria because normal way of measuring uh, aquatic uh, sediment oxygen demand is to stick an electronic uh, membrane microsensor into the sediment and it will just or an optical sensor and it will just tell you how much oxygen in total was consumed in your jar. But we really wanted to partition it. And uh, because of that, I got into the rabbit hole of bioreactive color tracers, uh, which are very fun scene to use, but also very unstable and capricious method. So there is a dye or a col a color tracer called resazurin. It was used by microbiologists to calculate the amount of heterotrophic bacteria in the milk and dairy products since 1930s. Essentially what it does, it tells you in relative terms how much aerobic respiration is going on in a system, be it a petri dish or aquarium or whatever. And it tells you that by changing color. Uh, so resazurin is... Um, is violet and its daughter compound, Rezarufin, is pink. And you can measure this transformation calorimetrically and by how fast the change happens, you can tell how much oxygen is getting consumed in the system. Um, the neat thing about Rezarufin is that it's only getting reduced to Rezarufin if it gets directly to the respiratory chains, so either to mitochondria or to respiratory membranes in prokaryotes. And then coronamids, it cannot get to mitochondria because coronamids has a heatinous cuticle and it doesn't get through because it's lipophobic. Um, so we actually were able to measure the total oxygen consumption in the system using an electronic sensor and then measure resazurin-based respiration calorimetrically and subtract it from the total and we already knew that the resazurin component of respiration is only bacteria and animal respiration is not involved. So we actually were able to partition how, who takes how much oxygen. And the interesting part here is, so here are three treatments with zero, 1,000 and 2,000 larvae of flies per square meter. And in the gradient of five different temperatures, from five degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, you see that at five degrees, there is essentially no difference between the density treatment and the difference between control with zero larvae and bioturbated uh, treatments is only increasing with the temperature. 
And at 30 degrees, the treatment uh, with 2,000 larvae essentially taken up uh, 4.8 times more oxygen on average than the control treatment. And because we partitioned the oxygen consumption, we find out that 95% of this additional oxygen is going to heterotrophic bacteria, which means because in the warmer water, there is a less oxygen. Larvae need to pump more water from the lake into their burrows, introducing more oxygen to bacteria, which are happily taking this oxygen and breaking down organic matter in the sediment, increasing the CO2 emission in very warm water by 4.8 times in comparison with the sediment where there are no larvae. So in um, lakes, with a lot of organic matter, or actually in any aquatic body with a lot of organic matter, like uh, marshes and lagoons of um, deltas like Danyana or Ebro or Camargue, which has enough organic matter, bioturbation will be capable of turning the systems from important sequestering sinks of CO2 into the sources, which is very worrying. Uh, when I done these experiments in the lab, in the climate chamber, one of the reviewers told me, well, Central European lakes doesn't really experience 30 degrees Celsius um, uh, heat wave events. Two months after uh, I published this paper, Berlin has experienced one of the strongest heat waves on record, and the lake where I was taking the midges from was staying above 30 degrees for a week, probably emitting enough uh, CO2 to make a difference. So you can see that rising temperatures impact uh, access of aquatic insects to the oxygen, changing their biogeochemical role, but also changing their populational structure, uh, and potentially making many ecosystems less viable for aquatic insects, probably leading to declines. And this is really important because many ecosystems really rely on aquatic insects not only like for fish food or um, you know, bioturbation, but also for the ecosystem functions not related to aquatic systems. Because, um, for example, in Iceland, in Muvatan Lake, which has over 200,000 larvae per square meter of the sediment, these larvae, when they turn into the adult flies, flying over to the shore and dying there, they are the main source of organic matter and nutrients for all the plants around lakes. So this um, aquatic terrestrial coupling and energy matter transfer is also crucial. And decrease in aquatic insects is not, you know, what's happening in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas there. What happens in aquatic systems is going way beyond cascading towards productivity of the plants on land, and then, you know, productivity of herbivores, then transfer into lower um, numbers of carnivores and so on. So the, any changes in the aquatic uh, insects, which are often uh, ecosystem engineers, can cascade far beyond just their aquatic environments. And so that's why studying their decline is very important. So I showed you this slide. So here is a short environmental history of monitoring uh, in a comics made by uh, my colleague Valentina, who is sitting here. So essentially, we as humans started polluting rivers almost as soon as we developed agriculture and sedentary lifestyle. You know, we got cattle. Cattle start depositing dung next to the rivers where they drink, and we start polluting rivers. Uh, and then it got even worse when we got to the uh, classical civilization age and Romans got their lead pipes and all the lead start being flushed into, I don't know, Tibrus River or maybe in Guadalquivir from Italica and Sevilla. So we have been dealing with environmental pollution and our activity decreasing numbers and diversity of aquatic insects for ages, but nobody actually paid heed until these two German dudes, Matthias Schwann and Johannes Schleiden, who were working for the Royal Hygiene Institute in Berlin during the early 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, when the Germany was heavily industrializing, and Kaiser was like, guys, water in Germany is undrinkable. Some, something should be done about it. 
And so they come up with a system called saprobity, which you mostly, I guess, familiar with. It's assessment of the quality of fresh water based on what organisms live in it. And that's when the monitoring essentially first started. So early 20th century, people started systematically monitoring biodiversity of fresh water and also other organisms. And I mean, we went a long way. This comic is actually about application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in uh, monitoring, but for us only the upper part is involved. But the crucial thing here is that monitoring is very young concept and we don't get the data beyond it. This here represents one of the best ever uh, monitoring data set in existence coming from uh, Breitenbach Schlitz station from which the crane flies on the first part of the talk also came. And the workers there monitored aquatic insects on the daily basis for 42 years, given us an amazing data set. So this is a river, this is a river in normal flow condition, this is a river in pre-drought condition and this is like a summer flood. This is a tiny river. You can jump over it in a normal condition, 20 centimeters deep. Um, this is some data. So as you see, it's a tiny river with a catchment of 8.3 kilometers and mean water, water annual temperature is 8 degrees. And that's how the insects were collected in this glass house like emergence traps. And here are technicians collecting the insects from the walls of glass house with uh, tiny motorized uh, vacuum cleaners. Um, and they mostly monitored and identified two species stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies. And that's how the vacuum cleaner looks after you collected the insects from the walls. Um, one of the most drastic things which you immediately see when you look at the area is that temperature, as I said, uh, rose from about 7.4 degrees of mean annual temperature in 1960s to almost 8.8 um, .8 degrees in, in 2010 when monitoring stopped. And this is also a very interesting graph. It shows the hydrological regime of the river over years. Um, the green dots are extremely dry years. And you see that um, there was only a few extremely dry years before 1990s, and then almost all years become extremely dry with a much lower water discharge in the stream past 1990. And that's what happened to an abundance of all aquatic insects in the stream during the period of observation. So essentially they dropped from about 40,000 insects emerging per one trap per year. So it's 40,000 insects per say five square meters of the stream to less than 10,000 in 2010. This is a 81% decrease in the mean annual abundance of the insects in the stream. Um, funny enough, uh, species richness has somewhat increased and then plateaued and started decreasing. And uh, Shannon diversity has increased and then plateaued after 1990 and even as did the same. We think that this inconsistent pattern, numbers decline but somewhat increasing uh, species richness was caused, caused by the warming. So before 1990, when the river was still cold enough, it was dominated by a few species of cold adapted specialist taxa, which then, which were occurring there in high numbers. But past 1990, warming of the water and increasing dryness of the area pushed this cold specialist to extinction and somewhat warm adapted species came from downstream or from other metapopulations. So they are more generalists, they adapted to a wider range of temperatures which led to slightly increasing diversity. But it's, I think it's also a temporary scene because areas keep warming and it's probably will become too hot for these generalists too quite soon. And we also showed that turnover was steadily increasing. So the process doesn't stop. Species still going extinct and generalists are coming in. And on the phenological side, funny enough, the Total duration when the flying insects are occurring increased by two weeks over 40 years. So 
so it's become warm enough for insects to fly for two weeks longer in the year. And they also start emerging from larvae uh, two weeks earlier on average. Because in the winter, there are not many flying insects in the stream ecosystem. There are some, but none of them are from these three groups, mostly. Um, and we are currently doing uh, additional research. Uh, this is non unpublished on fly data. So we have data on true flies, diptera. And funny enough, so this is our combined um, mayflies, stoneflies, and cadges flies, which are decreasing. But the orange line is diptera, like um, dolly hopodids and dancing flies. They were slightly increasing because majority in numbers and diversity because majority of the fly species occurring in Breitenbach are meso to hyperterm generalist, which could take the higher temperatures much better. So that leads me to the final point of the missing baseline, which I really wanted to address in uh, this uh, talk. So imagine that we have this 40 years of monitoring, which we got in Breitenbach. Imagine it's here with a solid red line. And you know, numbers are decreasing in sort of peaked line. Year, doesn't, year does differ from year based on the annual conditions, but numbers are going down. But many people are raising the question, OK, you started in 1969. Do you know that this is just not a part of a cycle? This is what many climate change deniers telling us about the current climate change. Yeah, but what if it's just a cycle and it's repeating? What if? Uh, what if numbers actually has incre increased from the prior years? Or maybe they stay stable and go in through the cycles of contraction and expansion and insects might be start coming back in Breitenbach in some years. Or maybe it's a true decrease. So we have here three simplified scenarios. But the thing is we just don't know. And that doesn't allow us to give a solid prediction extrapolated beyond our data. So what's going to happen with these aquatic insects? Are they going to come back? Are they going to keep decreasing to complete extinction? And you only will have a tubifex worm in this stream in 30 years? Or is it a cycle indeed? And it will keep going through contraction and expansion. We cannot answer it directly. There are several ways to compensate for the missing monitoring baseline. One of the ways is museomics. You can go take your insects collected in small numbers 200 years ago, try to do a haplotype on them using a fragile DNA extraction methods, and maybe see that, well, haplotypic diversity was way higher for this one species of butterflies than now, so populations probably were consistently decreasing. That's one way to do it. But um, I'm a paleobiologist, essentially, and I like to address it in a different way. So we all dealing with a shift in baseline syndrome. The state of nature for us now, which we consider as normal, would have been absolutely abnormal probably 200 years ago. Just I really like this comic by Cameron Shepard from Twitter. So this is like a normal state of our oceans 200 years ago, and then 50 years ago, and then now. And you know, biology students who go into the biology practice seaside would not be struck nowadays that there are too few animals in general, or there are too few wader birds. But those of us who are slightly older will think, well, yeah, it's a bit less than in my biology studies year. And those who are older yet and remember ecosystems 40 years ago would say, yeah, it's all decimated. And if we would be able to talk to a person who I don't know was going fishing in this area 80 years ago, this person will tell us, yeah, it's a complete disaster. So this is a shift in baseline. Our experience and our data are starting at some point, And we are missing what came before. But of course, thankfully, we have a paleobiology, the fossils, the fossil records to tell us what came before. And it can work on a grand scale, like this is a fossil site, Magrat Flats, which we described from New South Wales and Australia this year. And it shows us that 15 million years ago, at the current uh, semi-arid desert site, you had a mesic rainforest with uh, tropical plants, and the huge diversity of aquatic insects like this dragonfly larvae or uh, pollinators like this pergid wasp. 
uh, and you know it's all preserved in a extremely um, exquisite details and we can even do a quantitative reconstruction and place this site based on its botanical fossils into the gradient of temperature which tells us that it was in the range of 15 to 20 degrees mean annual temperature so like subtropical climate rainforest huge biodiversity now you have a dead kangaroo and the dust storm but this is a grand level of radiation and I mean fossils can do a lot more for us I just briefly skip through it so like we can study fossilized behavior this is uh, some fossil flies from amber preserving the fossil erythrocytes so this is a Cretaceous blood in a Cretaceous fly a little bit like in a Jurassic Park so fossils are real time capsule and that's how people normally think about it so here we have a preserved this is a synchrotron scan of a fly larvae on the case of a caddis fly in 40 million years old amber and there are a lot of these time capsules like you find this fossil O fly larvae in amber and you can infer something about its hunting behavior but beyond that we can go at much smaller scale because fossil record is forming continuously animals who die today will become fossils in several thousand years and because of that, because of continuous formation of fossil records in the sediments, we can look back using paleobiological methods, not 15 million years ago, but maybe just 200 years to establish a baseline for our monitoring. Um, I will have to skip it because I'm uh, talking way too long. Um, so larvae of extant aquatic flies are constantly living in the aquatic sediments like this coronamid or this cooperate a phantom fly and they also constantly die in the aquatic sediments and strongly heatonized part of their body are preserved in the sediment cores and you can extract and identify them it works well for Holocene and Pleistocene because they essentially still have this modern species of flies in the sediment and we can reconstruct quantitatively the temperatures of the glacial and interglacial interval in Europe using the species record of subfossil flies but we also can just take several upper tens of centimeters from a lake which formed over 200 years and see how eutrophication and temperature rise has changed the species composition of the flies just in this historical area we can zoom in on the sediments which formed in the last 200 years since the age of coal started and led to the industrial revolution and we can see how the faunal composition changed but we also can reconstruct the temperature record because we have a quantitative models to extrapolate the temperature based on the community species composition so this is a kind of a dual strand of this paleobiological approach you reconstruct the time series of organisms biodiversity but you also can compare this proxy temperature record with some meteorological data you might have or dendroclimatology you receive from analyzing the trees or pollen and so on and so in places like Doniana or in the lakes with um, strong um, organic sediment you can just extract the core uh, wash out the coronamid head capsules like that with a sieve in the lab not like me uh, hanging overboard precariously and then you can extrapolate this into the temperature models but also in the biodiversity records and you can for example compare this biodiversity record of say 200 years of midges in Doniana sediments with ongoing Estación Biológica biomonitoring efforts and see oh way few or way more species now and these species are more or less adapted to the high temperatures and you can partially restore this missing baseline it doesn't of course substitute a true monitoring but it gives you a ballpark of where biodiversity in certain areas is going and there are a lot of possibilities to upscale this you can compare your extrapolated baseline monitoring with any other monitoring efforts you conduct and like with the uh, ornithological monitoring of birds abundance and diversity and say oh insectivorous birds in this area were going down while 
we used the uh, during the decrease of diversity and abundance of these aquatic flies. So maybe it's connected. It can be. We know that um, insectivorous birds are in generally on decline in Europe, and especially those specializing um, on aquatic insects like Cinclus Cinclus. I, I don't know the Spanish name. You know the birds that dives into the streams and eat the insects there, and. What's great about this process, it can be done as expensive or as cheaply as you want. You can just extract the core of the sediment from a wetland, sieve it through the sieve in the lab, clean the specimens with, uh, calium with the potassium hydroxide and identify them under the microscope. Or you can go the route which me and my colleague Durat Milosevic are going and use the artificial uh, neural networks to help you to quickly identify the head capsules of the midges you mounted on your slides. And, you know, as I said, you can upscale it to birds, to the pollen records. And with this, uh, you can essentially get the tools for the better forecast of the ecosystem changes in the future by, getting, by extending your look into the past uh, beyond the concrete monitoring data you've got. Because we have, of course, very limited resources, limited time spans for our monitoring series. And so my message will be here is that almost any ecosystem level studies can benefit from bringing just a little bit of paleobiology into them. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, for the amazing talk. Questions? It's always difficult to have the start in the first one. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. It was really impressive and very exciting. And just a question on the first example that you gave mm -hmm. about changes in the, in the insects through time that the with the warming of the environmental conditions that they lost flying capacity mm -hmm. and well suggesting that the global warming is also changing somehow uh, gene flow between insect populations and so on but uh, to what degree do you think that that is important in the, ca in the case of chironomids in the sense that I guess that lots of the dispersal will be done just by wind. Do you really expect that these small changes, because I guess that with one degree temperature, the changes are going to be small, and maybe the impact on gene flow between the populations may not be as, as large as it could be. Do you think that could have an impact already at this scale on it's gene flow? It's a valid question. So I think I will answer in two parts. I think for chironomids it's not really important, but the study model there was tipolites. They still light animals, but you know, average tipolite is a fly of this size, and it's about 100 times heavier than an average chironomid. And they actually rely a lot on the active flight to disperse, and because their body mass has increased by 20% while their loading capacity, um, wings loading has also increased by 25, it means that they lost about 20% of their dispersal capacity and it might be significant. And if you go for even heavier insects, to whom it also can happen like Lucanus cervus, large beetles, which also rely on flight and could not be transported by the air, it might be very significant to them. And in fact, even small changes in the wind loading decrease dispersal capacity and gene flow very significantly. There is a paper from 2003 three, about temperature impact on the allometric and non-allometric components of the wing shape and size in Drosophila melanogaster. And two degrees temperature increase in the setups where this Drosophila were uh, grown um, has led to the 40 percent decrease in flying activity because flies become too heavy and they were mating less so and they had less and females especially has less interactions with males so it might be very significant it's difficult to say right now but what i was driving the point here 
yeah, I don't think that global tem climate change will break the gene flow within meta populations of a common insects. But you know, there are some insects which are barely flying, like some stick insects. They have already very strange gene flows. And if you imagine that population is highly fragmented and um, dispersal capacity has dropped beyond some critical threshold, it actually might mean life or death for some insects which are barely flying. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have described the, the analysis and, your, and the analysis of the long-term uh, study in the Bavarian stream. Mm -hmm. uh, you conclude that there is a, a species to an hour, a chain of a species that a cool lower species has been mm -hmm. removed, have been shut up, and uh, warmer adapted species are, are predominant in that, at that moment, at the end of the time series. But uh, my question is, you know or you have information about uh, the temperature or thermal sensitivity of these species, yes. tolerance, optimal, and so, so on, physiological stuff? Yes, so uh, we were very lucky. Uh, if I go back there. So in fact, all the, you know, it's not just some anonymized abundance data set. We had species identity for all the species, and we done a trade space analysis on temperature adaptation, so we checked it, in fact. So um, before, I, I don't have it on the slide because it's still unpublished and the images are not very good, but we done models showing that there was a break point uh, in the 1990s when mostly rheophilic cold adapted taxa in the trade space gave way to the mm, meso rheophilic or metapotam also like a normal riverine not stream adapted tax so in fact we did it we were very fortunate because this uh, samples are all identified to the species level and you know those are mostly common monitoring taxa and you have a quite good trade coverage for them so you can do a lot of things with them for example we done a analysis of the trophic uh, uh, adaptation change over time so it's not really well visible here but the um, bluish line on the top is a grazer scrapers and gray line over here is gatherers collectors and um, orange is a passive filtrator and uh, violet are predators and you can see that over time the specialists which were mostly grazers collectors and um, um, uh, no, no, grazers and collectors over here, they decreased. And the passive filtrators in particular has increased in their relative abundance because due to stream getting much less water, the sediment and organic particles were staying suspended in the water for a longer time, which made it viable for the mid to high temperature adapted filtrators to come into the stream and establish themselves. Yeah, but, but the, the question is, is to, to deep on the, on the physiological tolerance and so on. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, Lancaster Group examining the, the polar war migration of mm -hmm. dancer flies discovered that the, 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 those populations that are going to the north are not the warm adapted, are where the cool adapted. So if I, you I, have I, I agree. We don't so you have no information we don't on those know aspects of enough. physiology, mm -hmm. probably you are accepting the obvious thing, but uh, probably yeah, I, I, I have to yeah. I have to say that we don't know that much about populational polymorphism in aquatic insects in uh, temperature adaptation, except for the fact that it exists. We know that there are different allozyme groups active in different, say, mayfly populations, and some of these allozymes are better capable of breaking things down at higher temperatures, and the other at the lower. Unfortunately. Uh, resources which are going into the fine scale trait analysis in insects are simply insufficient. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks a lot for a very nice talk. That's really interesting. Uh, so that's mostly a curiosity question, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so I really like your idea 
about you know uh, the decrease in body size with temperature mm -hmm. uh, that could be you know possibly uh, related to oxygen you mm -hmm. know solubility or availability uh, I was just wondering and that's just you know from me not knowing but does this only happen in water or is this also applicable in you know air and so would that mean you know it also happens for any group of insects um, it doesn't happen for any group of insects so in fact there is a small community of nut cases who are trying to apply Alan Bergman rule to poikiloterms and they have been looking to different groups of insects. And for example, some families of butterflies only in Australia are getting larger when they go in up to the mountains, but the other families of butterflies in Australia don't show a significant uh, size difference between the lowland and mountainous uh, spe specimens. And then Beetles in Europe overall doesn't become bigger up north. The largest European beetles like Lucanus cervus, in fact, live in the temperate climates, not in the hottest, not in the coldest. But uh, Tribolium castaneum, the standard uh, um, lab rat among the beetles, does in fact become slightly bigger in the colder temperatures when it's grown in the lab. And then some dragonflies showing very strong latitudinal gradient, but of course they have aquatic larvae. And so it's very inconclusive. I think that there is no universally applicable size temperature rules for insects. It heavily depends on different factors. So uh, bumblebees often tends to be bigger in the colder climate. And because bumblebees indeed produce a lot of heat when they fly in, it might actually relate to the heat dispersal from the muscles. Um, so I think it depends for the aerial insects on how much heat they produce or how do they get heat from the environment or what is their habitat. You know, for example, still the largest insects are in the tropics. The longest insects are the Friganistria stick insect in tropical China. And then you have a Megasoma beetle, the heaviest insect in South America. But it appears that for many aquatic insects, this trend holds. So there is no one size fits all. There is nothing really like Alan Bergman rule for poikiloterms, I think. The size, the surface uh, area volume ratio might be important for some poikiloterms if they produce a lot of heat during the movement. But otherwise, I think factors like oxygen and vegetation period providing food for the larvae can confound the relationship between the size and the temperature. Thanks. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. And I have a baseline question for mm -hmm. you because you you mentioned this 200 to, to look back to 100 years mm -hmm. um, back in time. And you might have said it, but I wanted you to clarify why these 200 years. Is ah. it methodological, historical, ecological? Uh, I think that 200 years are important to maybe slightly more than 200 years because this is how long we have been burning fossil fuels in substantial amounts. So in Early 1800s, Industrial Revolution started in UK, and then it spread through Europe and North America, and then it spread through the world. So I think if we look just before Industrial Revolution, uh, before a large amount of organic waste started being pumped, in, uh, pumped into the rivers, and before a large amount of coal started being burned, already kick-starting the ongoing climate change, we can have a good baseline. So I found it's very funny. So in European Framework Directive, which tells us which water quality is good and how we monitor it, there is an interesting clause. The good water quality is a water quality comparable with the pre-quaternary condition in the area of monitoring, which I found hilarious because like, in Germany, water quality is formed through the interactions of forests and rivers. Pre-quaternary Germany, doesn't really have forests because we have a lot of megafauna which was just trudging through the lowland Germany, destroying the forests and eating on the mammon steps. So pre quarter okay, well not mammon steps really, but we have a lot of megafauna and we don't have that much forests. And without forests, water quality would have been totally different. So I think that like we need a baseline which better fits our human perspectives. 
we don't need to know what was happening uh, in Los Angeles uh, River Basin when the La Brea Mammoths were around. We need to know what was happening with Los Angeles rivers before first European settlers has came, or before the gold rush, maybe. Thank you. So Maria has a question, uh, I'll just read what she said, great talk. A question about the first example about the heavier flies. Do you know how their abundance have changed? Maybe it's a phenotypic change allowing them to persist better locally. Uh, so their abundance... Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, da, da, da. it's about the first example about the heavier flies. Mm -hmm. Do you know how their abundance have changed? And maybe it's a phenotypic change allowing them to persist better locally. Uh, well, I, um, yes, abundance of the flies was all over the place, but essentially, so abundance stay roughly the same, but uh, the gender ratio or sex ratio has moved towards the males, they become much more males than females, from 1 to 1 ratio to about 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 ratio by the end of observation. And yes, I agree, it's probably exploitation of phenotypic plasticity to basically stay alive, uh, and use more food, which probably became available through the increase in temperature, but it came at a downside of a worse dispersal capacity. Because essentially, you know, a phenotypic plasticity means that by changing one, say, morphological parameters, you're compromising with other parameters. Uh, I, I don't know, the like, a uh, heavier gazelle might produce more, f uh, more offspring, but probably will become much worse f at running away from a, jepper, uh, from a cheetah. So who knows? Uh, I mean, yes, it's definitely a phenotypic adaptation, probably entirely on the level of gene methylation or something, but it's also compromising, co in my opinion, I hypothesize that it's compromising coherence of metapopulations. So my question is about sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying about monitoring these changes over 200 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, would, only, uh, would this approach only work with very, very dramatic changes in the community composition? Or you think that um, you can really estimate abundances, not relative abundances, but abundances of different species from the sediment can um, it detect uh, if a small changes in temperature you expect and uh, to have bigger um, very dramatic changes in the um, community composition or to what degree you think that you can it's be an precise? excellent question and the answer is it depends and it mostly depends on the sedimentation rate so if environment deposits a lot of very fine sediment every year like most of the um, middle European lakes do or if environment deposits a lot of organic sediments uh, seasonally, like I learned today, Danyana does. It, so I learned today that in Danyana you can maybe actually go and get your paleoecological studies at 10 years resolution in the last 1,000 years uh, interval or so, which is really good. Um, you cannot really estimate true abundance because there are things like, you know, Fossils, sub-fossils getting destroyed, washed away, but you can estimate relative abundance indeed. So sensitivity is low, and as I said, it's like a, it's a proxy baseline. It doesn't substitute a true monitoring. However, it can tell tells you a lot of things. If you, for example, uh, Phenopsectra um, flavipenis is a very high temperature sensitive coronamid which would not appear if your lake cooling beyond uh, 8 degrees in the winter. If you suddenly uh, get Phenopsectra appearing in your record, after you, know, you had 100 years without Phenopsectra, then hop, in the next decade interval it pops up, it means that a crucial winter temperature threshold was probably crossed, and now it became viable for this species. So sensitivity is both high and low. It doesn't substitute the true monitoring backed up with the real monitoring of abiotic parameters, but it's a proxy. And as every proxy, it has a lot of limitations. 
but in an absence of the true monitoring series, um, it can tell you quite a lot. It also can tell you water levels because uh, coronamid larvae are very uh, depth sensitive. So it can tell you if you had Bentalia carbonara or Enfeldia marginaris for years and then they disappear, which are high depth adapted species and you get in something like Telopilopia, which is living in the shallows, it means that water uh, depth at this area has dropped for one reason or another. Two more questions in the chat that I think <laughs> are also passing the, the two o'clock mark. Um, so I'll read first Argos's question. I'll read this entire message. Um, dear Victor, many thanks for your talk. I see one caveat at trying to estimate a compositional baseline for insects. Mm -hmm. um, given their large mortality and reproduction speed, their populations should often reset after one or just a couple of years. Doesn't it undermine the utility of such a baseline? Um, to a degree, yes. But as I said already to Kavlis, it's a very relative proxy it's about relative abundance and presence absence. Uh, and there is also an added problem of a taphonomic bias when there is only a fraction of any given population is even going into the fossil record. But we have been able previously, for example, with the plant pollen to guesstimate in a ballpark that, for example, canary pine was declining and Gran Canaria for the last 500 years based on pollen record because of the increasing um, activity of humans, cutting it down, and also because of the increasing frequency of fires. And we can do similar things for the subfossil insects to say, yeah, okay, so we had 100 can head capsules of Bentalia carbonaria in this interval, then only two, and then there are none up until now where it also doesn't occur, which means that so as I say, this is a very relative baseline. Uh, I don't claim that any of these methods uh, stemming from paleobiology can substitute the real monitoring, but they give an interesting or tantalizing glimpse into the past of your monitored area. Thank you. Should I go? Last but not least, there's Duarte's question and mm. comments. So thanks for the interesting talk. Van Klink et al. found that freshwater insects are actually increasing uh, in abundance over the last decades. So <laughs> I, I wrote a reply to this paper, which was published, wh where I showed why they are actually wrong. <laughs> but uh, the short uh, version of, my, uh, of our, there were m more than 80 freshwater biologists, including me, who immediately after reading this paper, rushed to write an editorial reply saying, well, actually, um, you used a data set which not only contained insects but other aquatic invertebrates. So in many cases, like increase in oligohead worms or mollusks biomass made them think that the freshwater insects increased. Another reason, in some parts of the world, especially in industrialized countries, water quality has improved between 1950 and 2000. In Europe, uh, rivers went from 90% poor ecological quality to 60% medium ecological quality, 30% good. Uh, from, so 90% poor ecological quality in 1956 to 30% good, 60% uh, medium in 2005. So water quality improved, but water quality improvement can only take your insect population so far when then you get an under the water stress and double whammy of a climate change and increase in water exploitation from many communities. So particularly to one clink, I, I, I wrote a very lengthy and very mean reply, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else or what, hungry? <laughs> yeah. I certainly am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay, so just something that I forgot to say uh, at the beginning. I'm Bia, for those of you who don't know <laughs> And this is Leticia. And uh, Chris is still in the group, 
but <laughs> he will be leaving. So we are the um, re people responsible for the seminars in this season. So if you need anything or have someone you would like to come or if you would like to give a talk, please talk to us. And thank you very much. <laughs>